Hello, everyone. Woo! Should we get this party started? All right. First, I would like to introduce Nancy Bordeaux. She is a uh, Sechangu Lakota and an uh, a esteemed elder in the community, and she would like to get us started in a proper way in a prayer. So I would like to welcome her to the mic. Wopilatanka. <laughs> Le Tachankaluta, we me na si chagula kota hemacha, rose was hot kota mataha, ampetiki le taku wo chu e chanopiki, helena lila washte chanopi, we are tantaha, hena lena wana na uji pina, hechums e unskampi washi chunkopi. Good morning, I mean good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nancy Bordeaux, I am a si chagula kota from Rosewood, South Dakota. Uh, my Lakota name is which means her red road woman in Lakota. It's really good to be here today. Uh, I am honored to be here actually uh, to be able to do the opening prayer. And I would just like to, you know, um, say a few words about the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition and all the other organizations that are here on behalf of the, behalf of the women and the children. Uh, and I know that, you know, it's a hard work that they're doing and they worked, done this work for decades. And I know that, you know, a lot of times, you know, it is a work that is really, uh, it's a hard work, it's hard, I know, and it really hurts the heart a lot of times. And I think that uh, no matter what, you know, it's, we have to keep moving forward in this work. We don't, we don't ever talk about, you know, really the, the real reality of this work and of the women in the community that suffer from domestic violence and and sexual assault and you know even also the children that do and also the women that are murdered because of domestic violence and the missing and the murdered women this is really extremely important for us you know to be able to start you know the work and also the healing process for what has been happening you know for generations now we are now in a, at the point of recovering from historical trauma and achieving um, sovereignty within our own individual self. And this sovereignty really is about you know, our own self-determination to stand up and to be able to make those changes within you know, the family level, the community level, and the tribal nations level, and also at the level of uh, legislation and to be able to move forward and to also to make create allies that are going to help us to get to that place and so today you know we're so honored to be here today you know with the different organizations that you know represent you know the Native American communities and tribes and we're here together to stand up and to have a voice and to be able to raise you know that voice for the victims of domestic violence and to be able to also make sure that you know economically that we're able to take care of them and so in this way you know we give thanks for uh, the work that we do and from our hearts you know we're really a spiritual people and we know that whatever it is that we set our mind to do it's going to happen and everything that you know we know is for the good of you know our people but it's also for the good of humanity we are all in this together so i'm going to say a prayer today and and also um, be able to acknowledge in a prayerful way you know the land this land that we're standing on is dakota land and its traditional lands, you know, whether it's seeded or unseeded, and that we know the history of, you know, the Dakota people, and how, you know, they were, you know, um, they had experienced, you know, that historical trauma and the colonization, and we know the story about the Dakota 38. We know the story that, you know, the, half of the Dakota tribes were taken out on boat on boats to be the whole tribes were supposed to be removed out of this state but yet some survived and managed to stay here. And to this day, you know, it's illegal for Dakotas to be in this country. And so if we say that, you know, we're writing land acknowledgements, you know, there's actually gotta be some action taken behind that land acknowledge, those land acknowledgements that have been written by different organizations and by the county 
by the counties and so to us you know we're looking at this and this is important the reason why it's important is because we're he we heal from the land traditionally you know that is our way of life all our ceremonies are not our land waters you know are our ceremonies too women gave birth you know by the rivers and that was their place of where they go back to visit and where their children can go back to visit. We are connected with the land and we cannot heal without that land. In fact, if we lived and worked in these types of buildings for years and years, we're going to get sick and die. We're going to get all kinds of diseases. So we have to get out there and give thanks for the land. We have to go down by the waters and pray for that water. The land that we stand on, even outside here, we stand out there and we give thanks to Onchimaka for healing us and she sends us her healing energies. So all of these things, you know, our, our sustenance, you know, our traditional sustenance is from this land. And today, you know, we are working and moving toward, you know, food sovereignty and so many different things like that, that are helping us to recover from historical trauma. And when I say recover, we're not recovering from alcoholism or all of this. We're recovering our traditional ways and our way of life. So we say, Wopilatanka, and give thanks to Creator for that, and give thanks to our allies, because we know that when we do this work, and we have seen and experienced, that when our allies step forward and they help us, then they're blessed many times over. We live, you know, also in a spiritual dimension, because we are first spirit, then we are this physical body. This so basically, you know, it's really a spiritual life that we live, and we are that spirit, Wopila. I'm going to say a prayer and pray for health and well-being for everybody. Pray for health and well-being for the land. Pray for everybody that's here. I know that you're here in a heart-centered way, and when you're here in a heart-centered way, whatever it is need, that you need, you will be asked for because we go by our traditional values. And I, and I think the most important thing is to have that wisdom, you know, within that heart, to have that hope, that compassion, and that love and that, that dignity and the love, those are inherent in indigenous people and all peoples of the world. We need to get our dignity back. We need to bring that natural love of humanity and for one another back. We're not so different. There's not one person that is different here. We're all human beings. We're all made the same way. So pray for health and well-being and that everybody here, you know, have come here, what you came here for, and you may you know, good allies, good friends, and make good connections. This is very important for us in our work. We work hard in whatever we do, and we suffer from secondary trauma, and many of us have, you know, gotten sick with cancer or diseases because of the work we do. So we need to change that around for ourselves that, you know, capitalism doesn't rule our life. We need to take our healing sovereignty and individual determination back because each and every one, one of us really represents the tribal nation that are native Wopila. Please put your hands on your hearts. Lena <laughs> Let it talk about domestic violence and sexual assault. A happy key, Hana U Tunkashila, Lila Tunkashila, or Tekika, you happy Chalewana, Washi, Chunkumpina, Yahipina, Len and Ea Chante Ea Patampiki, Tunkashila, Lena Yushki, Yok Pia, Ahipina, Hana, Wainsh Igla Kapina, Lena Ata, Lena Yankapi, or Kola Kichapita, Chatunkashila, Hetchum's Air, Tunkashila, Wachewaki, Ha Mitaki O Yasi. We are hey, 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 h
kiayo, mi ta kuyeyo, wani wa china, ho ye wa yelo, hey ye yo. The song is so that my people may live, they may regenerate, they may increase and recover their health and well being. I should stand on. Oh, no, I don't, need on, I don't need to stand on that one. All right. <laughs> Miigwech, Nancy, for your beautiful prayer and your song. Um, I'm so excited to see all of you today. My name is Guadalupe Lopez, and I'm the executive director of Violence Free Minnesota, the coalition to end relationship abuse. Like uh, Nancy said, we're here on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. We acknowledge our responsibility and commitment to educate communities about this land and our relationship to it. And those are for people who came in all uh, walks of life. I'm here with my fellow coalition directors. Wave. Make some noise. Wave. I'm here with fierce advocates. Wave. Woo. We're here with supportive community members. Wave. Our policy makers. Woo. Thank you for showing up for survivors today. We're gathering here today in our house. Let me hear you. Whose house is this? Our house. We help make the policies. We help drive legislation. It is, we help vote people in. So I want you to remember that. Let's all remember that. That's why it's important. We, a lot of people work very hard, lost lives because, to make sure that we were here. And I wanted to make sure that we invest in survivors while we are here. We're here today to meet with our representatives to talk about the need for crime victim service funding. This funding is desperately needed so that survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, child abuse, and general crime can access services and support that they need and care for themselves, their family, because we all deserve that. Crime victim services are critical pieces of Minnesota public safety's infrastructure. Our programs provide education, direct services, support to individuals and communities experiencing violence in all forms. We provide legal support, medical care, mental health services. We address immediate needs like food and shelter. Without our programs, victims and their families would not have opportunities to heal and rebuild after being harmed. We need to in Minnesota to invest in survivors. I'm gonna start a chant. You guys ready to chant? All right. When I say invest in survivors, I want you to follow me. Invest in survivors! Invest in survivors! Invest in survivors! Invest in survivors. That's right. Our coalitions represent over 200 programs serving more than 68,000 victims and survivors of violence annually across the state, many of whom are here with us today, asking for funding increases to be able to do their work. Coalition advocates on our coalition advocates on the behalf of our member programs to lift the voices of victim survivors at the legislature and beyond. I'm a survivor of violence. I also don't know anybody in my personal life that hasn't ex either experienced violence or supported a loved one that hasn't experienced violence. I stand here today to invest in survivors myself. Chant with me, invest in survivors! Invest in survivors! Invest in survivors! Thank you for showing up for all of Minnesota's community relatives that have survived. And we also acknowledge and honor the ones that have not. We need the state of Minnesota to step up and invest in survivors, the programs that serve them, so that we can live in a violence-free Minnesota. Community, we urge you to share how crucial supporting advocacy services are for survivors in the state of Minnesota with your reps. Tell them about the very limited resources you may have to support the most vital needs of survivors and their families. Community, we urge you to share your knowledge with your legislators about how sexual and domestic violence is preventable and that it requires investment in survivors. Policymakers, we need you to support a robust, long-term increase in a base funding in crime victim services. 
We need your continued commitment to prioritize the safety of survivors, their families, and communities across Minnesota by investing in victim survivors. Chant with me. Invest to survivors! Invest to survivors! Invest to survivors! Invest to survivors! Make wish relatives and thank you. I would like to introduce Senator Kunish, who is actually a, a, a very big rock star. She is, <laughs> she is the author that started the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives work that turned into an office. I am State Senator Mary Kunish, and I greet you with a warm handshake and um, from my heart, uh, just as Nancy said. Um, I am a state senator at this time, formerly uh, a House member, and I'm so pleased <laughs> to actually take a break from committee hearings and meetings and, and phone calls and session right up there to be able to join all of you here this afternoon. I'm in my fourth year as a state senator, and I'm the first Native American woman to serve in the Minnesota Senate. I come from a long line of Hunkpapa Lakota women from the Standing Rock Nation, and it's those women, those very strong Kelly women, um, that set the, the role model for me in fighting for what's important and fighting for those that can't. If anybody knew my Auntie Jean, you just did not mess with her. I served in the, four, in the House for four years um, while I completed my 25 years as a teacher and a library media specialist. And I can't tell you how much the folks and the services that Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition, MNCASA, all of these organizations played an important part in crafting and constructing legislation that I spearheaded that created the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Task Force. Without them, we would not have been successful. If you're all here, and you are, look around you, um, you have deep concern for the historic and current violence against our people, especially our women and, and girls, our LGBT2S plus uh, and trans communities, and we are here in the Minnesota Senate and House dedicated to addressing those issues. When I first started um, this work in the Minnesota House, I stumbled on the role that I've been able to grow into addressing the violence against women and women of color here in Minnesota. One of them was the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Task Force, and we found that very early that data was not available. Legislators love data. They want to know where it's happening, how many it's happening to, why is it happening, and we weren't able to give them that information because it was never available. And if it was collected, it was collected in the most bizarre ways. It was contaminated information. I have to thank um, Nicole Matthews over there. who was my partner in so many of these things that I have been able to do. When I first uh, came up with the idea to create this task force, I knew I didn't want to do it for the community. I knew I needed to do it with the community. And I needed them to drive what our outcomes would be and who would sit on that task force. And unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of those connections as a new legislature, legislator, but when I reached out to Nicole, she brought people in. We had those conversations. She helped craft that task force, and then, lucky me, I was able to co-chair with her on the task force, the first in the nation task force for missing and murdered indigenous women. So 
So thank you, Nicole, and your 22 plus years of, of work in this area. It's not easy. It's heartbreaking. Uh, there are times when you just have to go home and crawl under the covers and, and pray for those that you've heard the stories about and then get up the next day. And when you come to a dead end, you have to wait and look and find that way to get to the next place. It's incredible. So I'm not telling you anything new when I share that more than four in five American Indian and Alaska Native women experience terrible violence in their lifetime. That's like 84.3%. That includes 56.1% who have experienced sexual violence, 55.5% who have experienced physical violence by an intimate partner, 48.8% percent who have experienced stalking and 66.4 percent who have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate um, partner. All of these organizations and all of you that are here today are doing the work that we need to have done to reverse this. Overall more than 1.5 million American Indian and Alaska Native women have experienced that violence in their lifetime and one thing remains constant. The struggle to document every woman, whether you're Native, Alaska, Alaska Native, um, African American, Asian American, Hispanic, who, women in general. <clears throat> we need to document every woman killed or injured by a former intimate or former intimate partner, as well as those victims that have been murdered while being stalked, engaged in sex work, or used in prostitution or sex trafficking. It's been really frustrating historically that no state or federal agency collects a comprehensive data on domestic violence or intimate partner homicide. As a result of completing the MMIW task force, um, we've been able to create the permanent office of the missing and murdered indigenous relatives, again, the first in the nation. <laughs> the office is continually, continuing to build those relationships and working towards the ballot data collection and access to different databases. The murder, violence, and harassment of people of color, Native women, and Two-Spirit people, those that live in poverty, are vulnerable, rural victims and children, members of our LGBTQ, 2S and, and more community members, um, need to have their stories told and they need to be documented. So achieving a violence-free Minnesota, we're set to do that here in, in the legislature. I will continue to work as hard as I can to eliminate the systems of oppression and disproportionate exploitation, marginalization, and enact violence, and find ways to enact protections against our women here in Minnesota. Last year, I created a reward fund that was, is located in our Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Office. And again, I want to thank Juliet Rudy, who is the director of that office. She is doing a profoundly incredible job, and she's pushing for that data. She's pushing for access to that data. She's looking for ways to prevent the violence that we see too often. So we created this, this reward fund to tease out information, to use for cold cases. And one day I was driving to the Capitol and I was looking at all those specialty license plates that you see. We just passed the black one and the environment one and this one and that one. And I thought, we need a MMIR license plate in Minnesota. We need this license plate not only to help fund that office and keep it sustainable, but we need it to build awareness of the violence against our relatives. And so last year, not only did we create that reward fund, but you all, and I want you all to run out now and get your very own Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives license plate, because funds for every one of those goes towards that office. So we can't prevent nor can we end domestic violence right now without community, without imagination, social norm changes, and the belief that the world is possible without violence. The women and our children in these communities do, do better, and we must do better for them. And so I thank all of you here today, Chi Miigwech, 
Wopila Tonka, Pinigigi, I just can't say how much it means to me to have you here and know that we have all of you out there doing the work that needs to be done, boots on the ground. Wopila Tonka. Thank you. I just also want to say in the crowd, I want to give a shout out to Representative Perez Vega. Thank you for being here. <laughs> now I would like to introduce one of a very important supportive uh, Rep Moeller is the chair of the public safety and also the author of our funding bill. So Rep Moeller, come up, come up. Thank you, thanks for inviting me. I tried to dress for the occasion today uh, with my color here and my jacket. Um, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you today, but also thank you for being here. Um, I am the chair of the Public Safety Committee and I'm author of the funding bill, but I also just wanted to give you a little bit of background about why I care so deeply about victim survivors and about the issues that you're advocating for. Um, I decided to go to law school because when I was in college, too many of my friends told me about their experiences of being survivors of assault. And the more I talk to my friends about it throughout my lifetime, the numbers are staggering, and I really wanted to do something about that. So I went to law school, uh, I became a prosecutor. It is a job that I still have when the legislature is not in session. I handle felony level appeals, and I handle all kinds of felonies, but gender-based violence cases are where my passion is at, particularly around protecting victim privacy. Um, for over a decade, I have worked alongside some of you who are here today, I don't know if Raina Alexander is here, especially working on that issue and trying to make sure that victims have, victim survivors have the right to privacy and the confidentiality of the communications that they have with their advocates. Um, and I'm really pleased that the Minnesota Supreme Court recently passed the Hope Coalition case to recognize the importance of victim privacy and confidentiality. But our work on that front isn't done because the statutes have an exception when it comes to domestic violence advocacy privilege that carves out an exception that courts are allowed to breach that confidentiality. And I don't think that is right. Uh, and so we are working to get that bill changed this year so that domestic violence uh, survivors and their advocates have that same privilege conversation that sexual assault advocates, uh, survivors and advocates have, that attorney-client privilege they have, the same kind of privilege you have when you go to your doctor. All of those communications are so important because those relationships are so important. And you know as advocates that in order to provide the best services to your clients, you have to have that relationship of trust. And so being able to put that into statute is critically important and so we're gonna work hard to get that passed this year. I, before I talk about the big one, the funding bill, um, I do want to talk about some of the achievements that we've been able to have together over the last several years. And really that's because all of you have shown up and have written or contacted your representatives. Yes, cheers to that, it's true. <laughs> We had survivor-led efforts that eliminated the statute of limitations in prosecution of criminal sexual conduct cases. Yes, cheers, cheers to that. We completely rewrote our sexual assault statutes to recognize that victims who are intoxicated and they're voluntary intoxicated also can get sexually assaulted and they deserve the same protections of law. We passed legislation to test all rape kits and to make sure that survivors can track and follow what's going on with their kits. With the great work of all of you and other legislators, we passed the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Office, the first in the nation Missing and Murdered Black Women and Girls Office. And 
And now we're looking at the missing and murdered Latinx community as well, because we rec yes. <laughs> Because we recognize that all victim survivors face barriers when they, are support, when they are reporting these crimes, when they're seeking services, if they're going through the criminal system. But we know that those barriers are even more severe for communities of color and for our LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus community. And so we recognize that and we're trying to do everything we can to take that into account. So now the big one is the funding request. And uh, as chair of the Public Safety Committee, I really wanted to author the bill this year to get more funding, so I am the author of the bill. And it was the first bill, uh, maybe the second bill, but it was one of the first bills we heard in committee because I really wanted to set the stage for this session so that people knew that this was a high priority for us this year in session. And I've also encouraged members of the committee to tour shelters that are in their community or talk to advocates who are in their community and so I hope you are reaching out to your own legislators and offering that and encouraging them to come out and meet with you as well. Um, I'm also to the point now where, you know, I know you've all heard it, this isn't a budget year, we don't have a lot of money to spend. Um, the amount that we did get this year is one-time funding, and I am to the point where members will come to me and say, I have this project and it just doesn't cost a whole lot and it's just this much, and I say, you have a domestic violence shelter in your district. If I put money to that, that's less money for your shelter. <laughs> that's how I'm talking about this. Um, because it... it <laughs> and it's not because what they're requesting isn't also important, but it's because we really have to prioritize this. Um, we understand that. We understand the growing problem that's created with the federal government and the VOCA funds. Um, and so whatever we're able to do this year, just know I recognize that it is a Band-Aid and that we need to create more long-term and sustainable funding for um, victim services in the state of Minnesota. So. So again, I just want to thank you all for your advocacy. Please keep it up. Contact Republicans, contact Democrats, contact chairs of committee, members of committee, all of the above. And thank you again for being here. Thank you, Chair Moeller. She's got survivors' backs. Next, I would like to bring to the stage Senator Gustafson, who has been a longtime supporter of gender-based violence and funding and bills. And so I would love if she could bring her to the, there she is, bring her to the stage. Yeah. Okay, I have to decide if I'm short enough or tall enough, and I don't know. Um, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm Heather Gustafson. I am a teacher, a mom. I'm a state senator for District 36. My, um, thanks. My uh, speech is probably a little less political than um, the others, and not that those weren't important. I want to first recognize Representative Kelly Moeller for all of the work that she has done. It's been years of it. And she's been on the forefront of a lot of it, a lot of really important things that needed to happen before uh, we flipped the Senate and we're able to work with her and do that. Um, as many of you in this room, I'm also a survivor. A survivor of both sexual assault, domestic violence. I think back to my previous life and the fear, and that hopelessness that I lived with. It's a good reminder that for so many people, Living through this day is an achievement. Um, keeping themselves and their children safe is the win of the day. Because every day is a struggle. Every day is unpredictable in the most dangerous way. For me, I'm thankful to receive services from the Alexander House in Blaine, the only domestic abuse shelter in the county of Anoka. I spent years in therapy. <laughs> I found my voice, and eventually I found my sparkle back. I stand here today as a state senator, which I never thought I'd be, because of the services, friends, family, and faith that carry me when I needed it most. Many people, just like the people I see here today, gave me the words I needed, the confidence I needed, the help I needed to take care of myself and my four daughters. 
Working with Minkasa and other community groups in my new role, in my new life, and the coalitions that they work with as well, have given me the opportunities to give back to those groups that have helped so many of us. We've done so many good things together. The bills we've worked on together support programs that are a critical piece of public safety infrastructure, prioritizing victim survivors' physical and emotional safety needs, providing legal support, medical care, mental health services, addressing immediate needs such as food and shelter. These projects provide emergency shelter and crisis response. They provide victims, survivors of violence and their families with support and resources for healing and justice. They provide community education, violence prevention. They promote public safety. When we talk about public safety, we have to keep asking for a two-part solution because we know what we need. We need to keep our communities safe through prevention and accountability, but we also have to take care of the victims who have survived, and they need our help putting the pieces back together. I know that in this space, we share the view that funding victim services is a priority. I'm thankful to everyone here today. I'm so happy that you're here, that I can see you. If you're a survivor, I'm just happy that you are with us today. And I'm glad that you're using your voice to stand up for those who need it. I want to close with Minkasa's mission statement because it's a good one. We envision a world free of sexual violence in which all human beings are treated with dignity and respect and communities are transformed through safety, healing, and partnerships. In addition to everything that they're doing to help us, I'm going to guess that they <laughs> probably give me a hug when I get off this stage because my knees are shaking. And I thank everybody for your patience and your time. Just know that my office is always open to you. I believe you. I see you. I will fight for you. Today is an example of hope and purpose. Thank you for being here. Thank you, so much. Thank you Senator Gustafson. All right, how are we doing, Minnesota? Who do we invest in? Who do we invest in? That's right. Okay, next I would like to introduce Commissioner Jacobson to the stage. Uh, good afternoon, thank you so much for the quick introduction. My name is Bob Jacobson, I'm the Commissioner of Public Safety, and it is my honor and privilege to serve in that position. Uh, it is so great to see so many people here today. Thank you so much. One of the things that I told the governor and the lieutenant governor when I started this job that a number one priority was to support and uplift those who serve in the service of public safety. And as I look around at all of you who are doing this work on a daily basis, working with our victims, working with our survivors, working day and night, um, on behalf of those who really need us, you are part of that public safety system that I want to say thank you. So I appreciate it very much. It is difficult work. I spent 33 years in law enforcement. I'm on my fifth job since I retired the first time. I keep coming back because of work like this that you are doing and that we're doing together in public safety. And I am so honored and so glad to be here today to help with that process and to help with that work. It is so meaningful. And for all of you, again, I know that day in, day out, you may feel like there's nobody out there paying attention to you. You're paying attention. As I've heard, you're the voices of our victims. You're the voices oftentimes of our survivors. You are there to help them. We want to be, and I want to be the voice for you to thank you for what you're doing. We are also very honored within the Department of Public Safety. You've heard a lot today about uh, missing and murdered indigenous relatives. That office now resides in the Department of Public Safety. We're very proud to have that within um, our organization. And we now also have the missing and murdered black women and girls. Kalina Burke, yep. <laughs> We are excited for the future. We're excited for the work that we can do together. I know that the funding is never enough. I've talked to several of you. I know that that's a continual fight. I know that. We hear you. We're paying attention. Uh, we want to work with you and work beside you and support you in any way that you can. we can. 
and know that those of us within the Department of Public Safety, we've got Superintendent Drew Evans here today from the BCA, who cares deeply about victims, whose office is working day and night on um, victims and helping victims of crime, including human trafficking, sexual assaults, murder, violent crime. He's doing a wonderful job. Kate Weeks, who you all know with Office of Justice Programs, is working day and night as well, trying to make our corner of the world just a little bit better alongside all of you. So with that, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you do. We will try to be your voice as well to amplify the good work that you're doing. On behalf of the Department of Public Safety, thank you so much for the work that you're doing for victims and survivors. We appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like to bring to the stage uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, who has been a big instrumental piece working on issues like LGBTQ, children's issues, gender-based violence. I also want to say a big chimmy gwitch to Lieutenant Governor and Governor Walt for the $10 million dedicated in the governor's budget. Thank you for investing in survivors. Thank you for having this box. I am uh, small but mighty. Um, uh, Buju, Peggy Flanagan, Indigena Kaz, Gijiwewe Damokwe, Indigo, Goabaga, Naganikag, Nandunjaba, Mangendo Dodame. My name is Peggy Flanagan. My spirit name is Speaks with a Loud and Clear Voice Woman. I'm a member of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe, and my family is the Wolf Clan. And I'm really honored and humbled to be with you in this space today. Uh, you just heard from our commissioner, uh, Commissioner Bob Jacobson. And I have to tell you, uh, his heart for people and his heart for this work is one of the reasons I am so grateful that he is in this role and working on our team. I think of him as a skinny Santa Claus. <laughs> and you know the movie Rudolph or the TV show, the stop animation? He looks like Santa Claus before Santa Claus, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So he's the right guy for the job. Anyway, um, I'm so grateful that he is on our team. And it's important that I say this and that I name this. Um, and for a long time, I couldn't. But I stand here before you today as a survivor and as a child witness. And we have to say those things out loud. Because for a long time, I made myself as small as possible. Because that's how I stayed safe. And I made myself as small as possible in rooms where we deserve to be big. And where we deserve to take up space. And to be seen and heard and valued and protected. And most importantly, believed. So I am so grateful that you are here. And I want you to share as much as your story as you feel safe to do, as much of your story as you feel comfortable, but please know that every time you share your story, it lets a little bit more light in. And it allows us to talk about these issues, because I remember one of my heroes, Sheila Wellstone, would often say, right, that people think that violence stays behind closed doors but it does not. It spills into our communities, into our families, and into our streets, and it impacts everyone. So the more we talk about it, the more we name it, the easier it will be to co-create solutions to the violence that we face in our communities, and that it will be unacceptable. So crime victim services should not be seen or siloed as a special interest group or issue. And I stand firmly on this. So please believe me when I say that this larger effort to support victims and survivors of violent crimes is both a public health issue and a public safety emergency, and it should be treated as such. We live in a world where it's considered a profound privilege to be able to feel safe 100% of the time. 
It is a reality that I have never truly known as a Native woman. To be able to walk through the world in 2024 and say with confidence that you are free from fear, you are free of worry, and your physical safety is not in question. To be able to say you don't have to think about violent transgressions, bullying, discrimination, or harassment. Think of how much we could get done, what kind of lives we could live if we didn't have to worry about those things. This is sadly not a reality for the majority of people, and it is certainly a weight that disproportionately impacts women, girls, our non-binary community, our LGBTQIA two-spirit plus community, and our black, indigenous, and communities of color. But moreover, it is an unfair and unequal weight that puts the onus on the victims and the survivors to heal, to mend, to prevent. When we know that violence and crime is both a pervasive and a systemic issue, it should not be left up to victims or survivors of violence to bear the emotional recourse, the trauma, the PTSD, or the devastation that is inextricably linked to their overall quality of life in ensuring an end to violent crime. The tragedy alone should be that someone has experienced an act of violence, period, full stop. And yes, let me emphasize that the crime victim services and the types of supports that you all are lending as organizations and coalitions and programs that provide for the general public, these are not only a necessity, but are required step for the human condition, for the human nervous system to be able to heal after experiencing an atrocity. And we cannot continue to normalize violence and expect that people adapt to an increasingly violent reality that is America in 2024. No, we cannot ask crime victim survivors to climb insurmountable mountains and to, do, and to simply bounce back after becoming the victim of a violent crime. To deprive, to limit, or cut back on the types of services and supports that victim survivors are justified in receiving, leaving folks to have to go without due to a lack of funding, or we need to see this as a lack of investment. For any victim survivor to have to go without is not only a failure of epic proportions, but it's also an attack on someone's humanity and lived experience. And as a state, it's going to take all of us to help break the cycle of violence by fostering a continued education and information, sharing across all spaces and places with people and community. And this work calls on cross-sectional approach that unites all levels of government, many of which you see in this room, and our state's legislature to not only save lives, but to better serve and protect victims and survivors of violence. And to all of our legislators who are here, who have been here, who have been in this work, I am so grateful for you. This work is ongoing, and we all know that it takes public safety mechanisms across jurisdictions to work together to help save lives. And that's why last session, we invested in the Office of Justice Programs for Victims of Crime by providing grants to organizations that provide services to victims of crimes that are not covered by domestic violence, sexual assault, or child abuse services. Last year's Public Safety and Judiciary Omnibus Bill also made it possible for the Office of Justice Programs to reimburse healthcare providers for the costs of sexual assault examination kits. This is an important step forward in ensuring victims of sexual assault are not charged for their own medical examinations. The Office of, How of Justice Programs is also working to help survivors find safe and stable housing through the 2024 Transitional Housing Program, which provides fundings for community-based nonprofits and tribal government programs to give survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault in Minnesota more housing options as they put their lives back together. But last year's investments are not enough, and as you heard from Guadalupe, we included in our supplemental budget $10 million in additional funding for crime victim services. And I want you to know, we did that because of the good work that you have done, and I also know that I have to look at Nicole and Guadalupe in the face if we don't do these things, <laughs> right? But here's the deal. This is a supplemental budget. 
And going forward, we should have expectations that these investments continue until everyone is safe. Because we know that these supports can not only be life-saving, but are critical to achieving safety and wholeness and wellness in our communities overall. And that's why it's up to each of us to lift up these opportunities for intervention and system change across all agencies that work directly with victims or survivors and the perpetrators of violence. I'm proud, as you heard Commissioner Jacobson talk about earlier, that we created our Office of Missing and Murdered Black Women and Girls through the Office of Justice Programs that work is just beginning, but it is important. And to folks who say, why do you need a special office? If you look at the data, you wouldn't ask that question. So these milestones highlight, I think, what we've been able to do as good policy because it has been informed by community. It's been informed by the lived experience of the people in this rotunda and folks all across the state of Minnesota because people were willing to tell their story, which is why we have to keep showing up. And I want to be really clear, this year, 2024, is going to be uncomfortable. And we're going to hear a lot about power and a lot about control and who should be controlled. And for some of you, for some of us, that could be triggering. That's real. But this is when we have to make sure that we are standing shoulder to shoulder with one another. Where we are working together to push back on that violent rhetoric because that impacts our young people and our communities and impacts how we can stay safe. So reject it, reject it, reject it. And lastly, I will say thank you to the six crime victim coalitions for creating an intentional space here in our house. This is your home. so that we can unite in solidarity and champion the critically urgent work that requires our continued commitment of time and attention and allocated resources. Thank you for continuing to honor the victims who are no longer with us, the families who have had to navigate indescribable loss, and for centering the voices of victims and survivors and the work that you lead across community every single day. We need you and Minnesota needs you. You saved my mom, and that is something that I will never forget. So, uh, thank you so much for having me today and for the work that you do. Um, and may we never forget the people and the lives and the many generations that have been impacted by violence. May we all find a place for peace and healing and joy undescribable joy in all of our lives. Gichimi Gretsch, thank you so much. Miigwech. Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. Oh gosh, I'm about to fall on that box. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, if I'm doing a time check, what are we at? 2.56. I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all of the executive directors. I want to say thank you to all the executive directors of the coalitions, of the member programs, of how you take care of your people. I want to say thank you to the survivors that are showing up today, that get up every day and do beautiful things. This work is hard. This work is not easy. And we get up every day to do it. And I want to say Chimi Gwich from the bottom of my heart, of all the people that came here today into this house, into our house. This is our house. And what we're trying to do, OK? I believe we can get a violent-free Minnesota. We deserve that. It's preventable. Let me hear you. It's preventable. All right. I also wanted to acknowledge that we are going to be having an honor song out on the step capitol for all of you, for all of the survivors, for all of Minnesota. So I want to say chimi for coming. 
and if we could all make it out to the front steps so we can be in solidarity with each other as good relatives for Minnesota. Miigwech.